Bruchem Aboim, thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. Um, this night, tonight, we are going to deal with a topic that uh, people seem to uh, be concerned with called punishment. You know, we find ourselves in a period of time where we seem to be focused on divine judgment. Many people are deeply concerned with the fear of being punished by God for their thoughts or their deeds. Uh, their service of God is connected, uh, and their connection to God Almighty is predicated on this concept, trepidation. Somehow their perception of God is of a being who is angry and is a strict disciplinarian. We see that with Yisro, that when he brought his sacrifices to idols, he was used to an angry, angry God, so that's who they served. And when he came to serve God, he actually served to Elohim, brought a sacrifice to God of judgment, and yet we see that he found that it was the God of the Yudke Bavke, the God of mercy. Again, God is not the same as idols. We do read in the Torah, though, in both the portion of Bechokosai and then again in the portion of Kisavo, what we call the admonitions. Some refer to them as the curses, consequences for not following God's commandments. On the other hand, we have been told that the Torah teaches us that no evil comes from above. We read in Psalm 89 that Olam Chesed Yabana, that the world was created for kindness. That being the case, how are we to understand the concept of divine punishment? So let us look into the Torah for some idea as to whether God Almighty is the source of our difficulties in life or not. In the portion of Beshalach 17.7, the Jewish nation while traveling in the desert is quoted as saying, Hayesh Hashem Bikirbenu Imayim. Is God in our midst or not? Well, immediately after that, they asked this question. They were attacked by the nation of Amalek. Rashi <clears throat> gives us a, a deeper understanding of these words. He states, God says, I am constantly amongst you and ready to provide for all of your needs. Yet you say, is God in our midst or not? God then says, as you live, I swear that a dog will come and bite you. Then you'll cry out to me and know where I am. Rashi continues and says, this can be compared to a man who carried his son on his shoulders. And they went on a journey. The son saw an article and said, Father, take that thing and give it to me. And his father gave it to him. And so to a second time and again a third time. Then they met a certain man and the son said to this person, uh, Have you seen my father? Whereupon his father said to him, you do not know where I am? The father then placed the son on the ground, and a dog came along and bit him, based on a tanzkuma. We read in the beginning of chapter 21 in the portion of Chukos that people were complaining about God, Moshe, and the Mon, the spiritual food that fell daily from heaven. Well, in response to their complaints, verse 6 states, that God sent poisonous snakes against the people, and many people died. Rav Shem Hirsch notes that the Torah does not say the Hebrew word by Yishlach, which would be translated as he sent. It rather uses the Hebrew word by Yishalach, which would translate as and he allowed to be sent. During the whole period of the 40 years that the nation traveled in the desert, there is no mention of any person being bitten by a snake or a scorpion. It was only here, at the end of the 40 years, when the nation complained bitterly against God and Moshe. Then they were bitten and some died. The wording is very precise, and it tells us an important fact. God did not send the poisonous snakes to bite the people by Yishlach, but rather he removed his divine protection from the nation and then by Yishalach, he allowed nature to take its normal course. Look at the nature channel. Nature can be dangerous and many times cruel. People who travel in the desert are many times bitten by snakes and scorpions. That's natural. We also see with the ten plagues that God brought in Egypt. With each of the first nine plagues, they are referred to with only one word, which describes what they were, dam, blood. Sardea, frogs, kingdom, lice. It was only with the last plague, the killing of the firstborn, that the Hebrew word maka 
which means plague is used. So we see that in reality, there was actually only one plague that God brought on the Egyptians, what we call makos bechoros, the killing of the firstborn. So what were the other nine plagues? Well, they were instructional in nature. God, as a loving parent, was trying to bring the Egyptian nation to a state of repentance for their misdeeds, tough love. Only after his efforts failed then, and only then, did he bring punishment, the killing of the firstborn, Marcos Bacharos. The wording of the Pesach HaGal tells us an important fact about this plague of the Marcos Bacharos. It states that this plague was brought by God Almighty himself. As we read in the Haggadah, God took us out of Egypt, not through an angel, not through a seraph, a fiery angel, and not through a messenger. The Holy One, blessed be he, did it in his glory by himself. As the paragraph ends, I, God, it is I and none other. You know, the wording here is very important because what it is telling us that in most situations, when we think that God is punishing us, we think of his active participation. However, that is seldom the case. In most scenarios, God has his messengers administer pain and retribution. However, when it came to the taking of the Jewish nation out of the oppressive slavery of Egypt, God, so to speak, came to the plate himself. There was no pinch hitter. The Egyptians had persecuted his children, and he took it personally. God wanted known that he had chosen the children of Israel as his firstborn child. Anyone who hurts God's child hurts God Almighty himself. You know, in the portion of Ayelech, 31.17, it states, I will then display anger against them and abandon them. The verse continues and says, I will hide my face from them and they will be prey to their enemies. You know, the Holy Baal compares it to a king who tells his servant to beat his son, the prince, for crimes he had committed. But as long as the king was watching, uh, the servant hesitated. So the king hid his face from view and then the servant beat the prince until he cried out. Even in the worst of times, God's presence can be seen in the background. Uh, without a doubt, two of the darkest moments in Jewish history were the destruction of our two temples and the exile of the nation from the land of Israel. Where was God and how could he have allowed such pain and devastation to exist to his house and also to his land? You know, it was not God who brought, brought about the destruction. It was the sins of the people. God as a father is what we call erech long-suffering. He seldom punishes the beloved people. He just removes his protective and watchful eye from them. Both temples were destroyed, but only after a period of some 400 years. God does not want to punish the sinner. No, he only wants to remove the sin. He is, any, he is, he is as any love, loving father wants us to grow, to reach our potential, and hopefully fulfill our mission in life. Even today, we still mourn the destruction of our temples with four public fasts. These, they, we observe these fasts throughout the year. They are the fast of the fourth, the 17th day of the Hebrew month of Thomas, the fast of the fifth, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, the fast of the seventh, the third day of the Hebrew month of Tishrei, some Gedalia, and the fast of the 10th, the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Tavis, the 10th month. So where was God during the destruction of his house? If you add up the number of each month, four plus five is nine, seven is 16, and 10 is 26. The numerical value of the gematria of God's holiest name, his name of mercy, Sorry. He is always there in the background, a, a loving father watching over his children. There are times when we, he may remove his protective shield from us. He does so only in the hope that we should correct our errant ways. Again, tough love. When we experience difficulties in our lives, we think that God is punishing us for our sins. We see it as a negative. But in reality, we should see it as a positive. God is always trying to direct us towards the proper path. 
Without the obstacles that we encounter, we would never think of changing direction or finding a better and more righteous road. Sadly, it is many times the pain that becomes our greatest teacher. As the saying goes, if you are on a path and there are no obstacles, well, you're probably on the wrong path. Why don't we put our hand into a burning fire or continue to walk on a broken leg? The pain that we experience alerts us to the fact that something isn't quite right. Without pain, we would constantly hurt ourselves and continue to do so with dire consequences. So though we wouldn't volunteer for any pain, it has a positive purpose. It helps us to grow and to live a better life. You know, when God removes his presence, we begin to live a natural existence. Well, huh, nature is many times cruel and exacting. Nature teaches us that there are consequences for our actions. This world is in reality a minefield. Without his instruction manual, the Torah, navigating this world would be difficult, if not impossible. As we see, a witness with the generation of the flood, without God's presence in our life, we would self-destruct. So God doesn't punish. What he does, he just steps back, if you will, and lets nature take its natural course. However, when we acknowledge that there is a God in this world and that we truly regret our transgressions, well, guess what? Not only does he forgive and forget, he actually gives us the ability to turn our negative actions, our sins, into mitvos, good deeds, an amazing gift, one that can only be given by a benevolent father. So, no, God doesn't punish. He instructs. He directs behind the scene. He, like any loving parent, hopes that we will make the right choices. When we wander from the proper path, he tries to direct us. He tries to get us back to the right course. This is what we refer to as Yira Sashem, the fear of heaven, the fear that God has, like any parent, that we might possibly make the wrong choices. Is there any decent parent who wants to punish their child? Of course not. So how can we see God any worse than any normal loving parent? So in the end, does God punish? The answer has to be no. When we fail to acknowledge his presence in this world, what he does, he allows us to experience consequences in the hope that good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So let us hope and pray that we have in a relationship with our Father in heaven predicated on love and awe rather than a relationship based on fear and punishment. And with that, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Tzikainu quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for attending. Again, God should bless you with all that's good. May you be safe, happy, and healthy, and only know good in life. Have a great Shabbat. Thank you.